try to get the PowerPoint. Uh, good morning. It's wonderful to be speaking from the Mountain platform, although I must say that it's not the same thing as meeting under the leafy trees of the Vijayaranya school. The uplifting ambience as dusk settles into evening lights, the uh, gentle breeze, face-to-face -face interaction, uh, the mood elevating mountain magic, we miss all of them. Hopefully, as Vikram said, we'll get back there as soon as possible. But meanwhile, let's get down to business. When uh, Ajay and Vikram invited me to speak on the corona crisis, I struggled hard to determine what I should say. There is saturation coverage of the crisis. Our TV screens, our newspapers, our online streams, WhatsApp messages, they're all full of the corona crisis. What is it that I can say that will add value? What new insights can I bring to the table? After much thought, I decided that the best I can do is to raise some issues which hopefully will form the basis for some debate and discussion. But before I do that though, a small thought experiment. Today is May 10, 2020. Throw your mind back one year. Imagine today is May 10, 2019. If on this day last year, I told you that when you wake up next year in the morning, you'll find that our streets are deserted, our factories are shut down, our shops are closed, our offices are shut, our malls, our cinema halls, our hotels, our restaurants are all empty, our transport systems, rail, road, air, they've all come to a standstill. What would you imagine that situation to be on account of? You perhaps think that this is an unprecedented Bharat band organized by all the political parties in the country coming together. Or perhaps you think that we are preparing for an impending nuclear attack. If I then told you that if you go to Punjab and look ahead on a clear day, you can see the Himalayas. If I told you that our rivers, which are normally putrid and dirty, are clean, and some of them even have water, in the middle of summer. If I told you that the best way you can save the world is by lying in your bed, what would you imagine that situation to be? That's how unusual and unimaginable this crisis has been. So let me, let me start with the big picture, India's challenges and prospects. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, brings out a report the World Economic Outlook twice every year. The latest report came in the middle of April. As part of the World Economic Outlook, the IMF puts out growth estimates for all the countries. The IMF estimate of growth for India for this year, fiscal 2021, is 1.9%. Although that estimate was made less than a month ago, it already looks outdated. Most analysts believe that our growth this year will be negative, that our economy will actually contract. We were growing at 5% or perhaps less last year. We'll be growing at 0% perhaps less this year. Our 5 percentage points sharp decline in growth in just one year. Such a steep decline can mean a very painful, very difficult, a very disruptive adjustment even for a rich country. In a poor country like India, it can mean millions of households suffering enormous pain and hardship. Our businesses, our enterprises, our firms being pushed into bankruptcy. Our financial stability becoming vulnerable. This lives versus livelihoods has been a common issue in public policy discourse during this crisis. If the government battling the corona crisis is confronting this dilemma, but the dilemma is arguably the sharpest for India. Given our weak medical infrastructure, 
on high population density, any lapse in prevention can mean loss of millions of lives. On the other hand, a stringent lockdown to control the pandemic can mean millions losing livelihoods. This is a very difficult balancing act, particularly for us in India, because our economy was quite in a bad shape even as we entered the crisis. Go back to January four months ago. What were we worried about then? We were worried about our growth. Our growth four years ago was 8%, three years ago it was 7%, two years ago it was 6%, last year it was 5%, this year, 0%. So our growth, which is slowing, is now going to stall. What else were we worried about? We were worried about our fiscal deficit. Our central and state governments borrowing too much. By the time this crisis is over, we'll be worried that our central and state governments are borrowing much too much. We were worried about our financial sector, the health of our banks, the health of our non-bank finance companies, the level of our non-performing assets, the trust deficit in some of our bigger public private sector banks. All of those parameters are going to deteriorate as we get out of the crisis. Our financial sector, which is under deep stress, will be under deeper stress by the time this crisis is behind us. It's a grim situation. Actually, if you look at the IMF numbers, you will note that our growth is relatively better than most other countries. But that, that, that's no consolation, that's nothing to gloat about because of the very difficult, painful adjustment that we have to make, as I said earlier. Even in this grim scenario, there are some silver lines. I want to point them out. The first is our external sector, relatively stable. Yes, exports have declined, because there is a global recession, there's no demand for exports, exports will decline even further. But on the other hand, price of oil has crashed, so that to some extent that will balance. Yes, the rupee has depreciated, but not as much as the currencies of other emerging markets like South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, or Indonesia. And we have robust foreign exchange reserves. So the first silver lining is our external sector. The second silver lining is the bumper agriculture crop. Just look at this, which is already a difficult situation. If the, if the crop was poor or low, it would have been even more difficult. It is true that the agriculture sector is only 15% of our GDP, but more than 55% of our population depend on the agriculture sector for their livelihood. Their well-being is determined by the agriculture sector. So therefore, we have to be thankful to our farmers for the bumper crop. The third silver lining is the possibility, even the probability of a V-shaped recovery. Why do I say that? What we, why I say that because what we're going through today is not caused by a natural disaster. There was no cyclone, no flood, no earthquake. Our factories are still standing. Our roads, our infrastructure is still intact. Our transport systems will work. Therefore, with the right policies, with the right stimulus after the lockdown is ended, we can engineer a V-shaped recovery. I must add though that a V-shaped recovery is not inevitable, but it is still possible, probable, and we can engineer it with the right policies. So I thought I'd flag those silver linings. We can perhaps get into some discussion during the Q&A if necessary. So let me now get to the issues. I'm going to talk about eight issues. Uh, the first is how different is this crisis from the global financial crisis of 2008? This is not just an academic issue. Understanding this is important because it has implications for the nature and effectiveness of the solutions to this crisis. In particular, I'm going to talk about three differences. The first is the level of uncertainty. Every crisis is defined by uncertainty. 
There was uncertainty during the global financial crisis. In rich countries, there was uncertainty about how markets might react to all the quantitative easing they were doing. Here in India, in the Reserve Bank of India, we were asserting that our financial sector was safe and sound. But we were uncertain to what extent markets will trust that assertion, to what extent the public will continue to believe that assertion. But the uncertainty in this crisis is different. As someone said, it's a very unusual uncertainty because there are too many known unknowns. For example, how effective are the lockdowns? What is the process of recovery? When, if at all, will we get herd immunity? When will we get a vaccine? When will we get a cure? Will the pandemic come back in waves? Understanding this difference is important because what does it mean for the for resolution of the crisis? What it means is that we must keep some ammunition available for use later, not use all of it right away. Some policy ammunition we must keep, we must keep our powder track. That's the first difference. The second difference between the global financial crisis of 2008 and this crisis is the, uh, is the origin and transmission of the crisis. Remember, the global financial crisis was a consequence of reckless risk taking in the financial sector. The financial sector collapsed. People lost their wealth. People lost their savings. They stopped spending. Their faith in the financial system was broken. On the other hand, this crisis is a consequence of a cause from outside the financial system, from outside the economic system. It spread first to the real economy and then to the financial sector. What does this mean for the solutions? What this means is to follow. The central challenge during the global financial crisis was to restore confidence, restore the broken faith in the financial system. Once that was done, everything else fell in place. The central challenge during this crisis is to beat the pandemic to instill confidence in the public that the pandemic is decisively behind us. That solution has to come from science. Meanwhile, we're seeing that governments are coming out with fiscal packages, central banks are cutting rates, injecting liquidity, doing a lot of unconventional things, just as they did in 2008. But there is an important difference. In 2008, central banks like the Reserve Bank of India were in the forefront of managing and navigating through the crisis. In this crisis, central banks are doing a, are doing a holding role until the crisis is resolved elsewhere. That's the second difference. The third difference quickly is the following. Although the global financial crisis was called global, it did not affect all the countries to the same extent. India, for example, was less affected than most other countries. China was even less affected than us. So even as rich countries, big economies were weighed down by the crisis, there were other big economies like China, which provided the stimulus. In fact, one of the less acknowledged facts of the 2008 crisis is that it was China's stimulus that held the global economy afloat. In this crisis, on the other hand, every big economy, every rich economy, is weighed down by the crisis. There is no single economy, there is no single large economy that can provide stimulus to the rest of the world. So those are the three differences between the 2008 global financial crisis and this one. Let me move to the second issue. The government announced the fiscal support package of 0.8% of GDP. Is that sufficient? No. It is not sufficient when it was announced on the 26th of March. It looks even less so now. In fact, the government needs to spend more and spend more on three things. The first item of expenditure is to enlarge and expand the livelihood support. Since March 24, when the lockdown was imposed, millions more of households have become vulnerable that run through their savings, they have no money to live on. So livelihood support has to be extended to many, many more households 
And because they run through their savings, they have nothing left to live on. The government needs to much more, give much more per household. And the government needs to give livelihood support for much longer. Indeed, even beyond the lifting of the lockdown until some semblance of normalcy comes. So the government needs to cover more households, give more per household, and give for much longer to each household. Thus, the first charge on government expenditure. The second, quite obviously, is to enlarge and expand and improve our medical infrastructure. Our hospitals, our beds, doctors, support staff, lab equipment, testing equipment, forward and backward linkages, all this need to be covered. And the third item of expenditure has to be providing guarantee support for bank credit to private enterprises. That, unless that guarantee comes, banks are not going to lend. I'm going to talk a little more in detail about this, For now I just want to flag this, that the government needs to spend on a guarantee scheme in order for banks to lend to private enterprises, both now during the lockdown and after the lockdown is lifted as they restart their activity. So that's the first issue. Excuse me, the second issue. So it's quite clear that the government needs to spend more. That's a moral imperative. That's a political imperative. In order to spend more, the government needs to borrow more. The question is, how much more can the government borrow? How much more should the government borrow? There is one view that this is an extraordinary crisis. This is an unusual crisis. Therefore, the government should not tie itself by setting itself a limit up front. It must spend as much as is necessary. Therefore, it must borrow as much as is necessary. It should not tie itself down by setting itself a borrowing limit right, right up front. I disagree with that view. I believe that the government should itself set itself a limit up front. And that's why I endorsed the government decision made last Friday, where they said that they're going to borrow additionally to the extent of 2.1 percentage points of GDP. Why is that sort of setting of a limit important? It's important most first because our fiscal deficit is already high. The combined fiscal deficit of the center and state governments for this fiscal year, as budgeted, is 6.5 percent of GDP. Because of the loss of revenue on account of the lockdown, because of the decline in nominal GDP on account of the lockdown, the fiscal deficit will go beyond 10% of GDP. The additional borrowing we're now going to do will take the fiscal deficit to the range of 13 to 14% of GDP. That is exceedingly high. And will have all the negative consequences of high fiscal deficits. It will crowd out private investment because it will raise interest rates in the economy private investors will find it too, too costly to borrow, private investment will not take place. It will put inflation pressures. Remember, every extended episode of inflation in our economy has been because of extended fiscal profligacy. Third, we'll be vulnerable to balance of payments pressure. The bruising balance of payments crisis in 1991 as well as the near crisis in 2013, were a consequence of extended fiscal profligacy. So all these negative consequences will dent our growth prospects in the short term, perhaps even in the medium term. This is a grim outlook, but we can't ignore the lessons of experience. In determining how much a fiscal deficit is sustainable, we should also be wary of market reaction, how markets might respond to our fiscal deficit. I'm on a WhatsApp group where this issue was very intensely discussed. There was one view of fairly respectable intellectual credentials that this is a crisis arising from non-market forces. And therefore, as we navigate through this crisis, we should ignore market forces. Indeed, some people even went further to say that ignoring market reaction is the right thing to do. I hope they're right. 
but I have my own doubts. You can't, as an emerging economy, wish away market forces, ignore market reaction. Remember, every emerging market economy over the last 25 years has been caused because the economy concerned has lost market confidence. It is not as if the underlying problems were so overwhelming. It is not as if a smooth adjustment was not possible. Mm -hmm. But the markets did not allow them a privilege. Take the example of the Asian crisis. Australia, a rich country, and the East Asian economies, middle income countries, had the same type of problems, had the same level of pressures, but the markets allowed Australia to make a smooth adjustment. Markets did not allow East Asian economies to make a smooth adjustment. They made a crisis, a devastating crisis in Asia, self-fulfilling prophecy. What is the moral of the story? The moral is that this is an unequal world. Markets are more forgiving of excesses by rich countries, less, they're less forgiving of excesses by emerging economies. And we should be wary of that. We cannot make public policy on wishful thinking. So the bottom line is that it is good that the government has set itself a fiscal limit for additional borrowing that will make government expenditure more transparent, more accountable, more efficient, and hopefully we will even retain market confidence. Let me now move to the fourth issue, which is what's RBI done so far? RBI has cut rates, has injected liquidity, and has indeed done some innovative things to support specific sectors. So what is the logic behind RBI's actions? Let me briefly explain that. First, the RBI asked banks to give a moratorium on debt servicing. Why? Because borrowers do not have a revenue stream. They do not have the income to service the debt. Therefore, RBI asked banks to give a moratorium and RBI also gave a regulatory forbearance saying that defaults now will not be reckoned towards identifying or recognizing non-performing assets. That's the first thing. Then RBI has injected enormous amount of liquidity. Why is that important? That is important to give confidence to the banks and to financial institutions and to maintain financial stability. Just note this, if you, went, if you had a fixed deposit in a bank, and if you went to a bank today and said, look, I want to redeem my deposit, the bank cannot say, sorry, we don't have money, come back next month. That's not tenable, right? Banks need liquidity, even though there is no repayment of the debts. Therefore, RBI injected liquidity. The third thing RBI did is to cut rates, cut interest rates. They cut the repo rate, they cut the reverse repo rate to encourage banks to lend. And the fourth thing they did is to provide support through some targeted schemes for specific sectors, non-bank finance companies, housing finance companies, corporate bond markets, medium and small industries, um, mutual funds. So RBI provided support through specific schemes to all the sectors. RBI, I believe, was driven by two objectives. The first is to preserve and protect financial stability. The second is to encourage banks to lend. I believe the RBI has been fairly successful in the first objective, has not been so successful on the second objective. So that takes me logically to the fifth issue, which is why are banks not lending in spite of RBI's monetary issue? RBI has cut rates, injected liquidity, came out with special schemes for special sectors. Why are banks not lending? Banks are not lending for a very, very important reason. The binding constraint today is not the interest rate. The binding constraint today is not liquidity. The binding constraint today is actually risk aversion. Banks are already saddled with high non-performing assets. 
they're worried, they're concerned that if they make loans in this risky period, their NPAs will mount even further. And banks need to be backstopped. We need credit flow to private enterprises now during the lockdown to enable them to maintain payments like statute reduced payment salaries, etc. And importantly, we need credit flow after the lockdown is lifted for enterprises to restart their production. And banks will not lend by themselves unless there is a backstop mechanism. And that backstop mechanism cannot come from the RBI. It has to come from the government by way of credit enhancement or a credit guarantee facility. I must emphasize that such a facility is important across the entire economic activity, but particularly important for medium and small industries. Take the, take the US, people point out the US example, the Federal Reserve is doing so much. But note this, even as the Federal Reserve is lending to the private sector, is lending to the corporate sector, it's been backstopped by the US Treasury. The US Treasury gave the Federal Reserve something like $480 billion as a backstop. So unless here in India too, the government gets a credit guarantee support, banks may not be forthcoming in lending. That takes me to the sixth issue, changing gears somewhat, which is that uh, center and states are fighting the corona crisis together. Is this an illustration of cooperative federalism? It most certainly is. First of all, I must place on record <clears throat> that our central government, our state governments are doing an extraordinary job under extremely difficult circumstances. So we must be thankful to all of them, all the people in the government. And that's been possible in part because of the center state cooperation that we're witnessing today. The central government has the big picture. They're drawing from experience around the world. They're drawing from the experience across the country under setting the macro policy. The states, on the other hand, are at the front line doing the micromanagement. The central government is setting the macro guidelines, but has given flexibility to the states to tweak those guidelines, adapt to their local conditions. The prime minister has held several meetings with chief ministers, and we're seeing the results of the center state cooperation in, this, in the management of this crisis. Indeed, I believe this is a good model to follow even after this crisis is behind us in resolving some of our other big issues. For example, the second generation reforms in land, labor, agriculture, marketing, investment. These are big nat national issues and they cannot be solved unless the center and states come together, unless the prime minister consults the chief ministers. And they come together cutting across political lines. In a democracy, Politics are important. Political differences are not only inevitable, but value adding. But in resolving national problems, I think we should go beyond political differences and manage them as one country, one nation. We see center state relations, center state tensions in every federation. In the US, for example, we see today several governors of states are resenting guidelines being given centrally by the Trump administration. Wisdom lies everywhere, including in India, in managing those tensions amicably. So let's hope that this model of federalism will become an enshrined model for solving and resolving all our national issues. I must also make a comment here on fiscal decentralization, the fiscal dimension of center state cooperation. Fiscal decentralization is a huge issue, it's a complex issue, I do not want to wade into it, but I do want to make one brief comment because it's relevant. We're seeing states today ask the central government for financial support. We're seeing also the central government being somewhat hard fisted. The stereotype view is that the central government is sitting on an inexhaustible 
uh, set of resources and it's not giving to the state governments. That is not true. Thus, stereotype view is wrong. Both the central government and the state governments are under deep fiscal stress. Both of them have lost revenues. Both of them need to spend more. Both of them need to borrow more. Both of them have hit their borrowing limits. So central government and state governments need to work together. Certainly, because states are in the forefront of fighting this crisis, it is they who have to improve and expand medical infrastructure, who they have to provide livelihood support on top of what's being given by the central government. States certainly need much larger support than is being given now. But states also should be sympathetic to the limited resources that the central government has. Let me now move to the seventh issue, how to restart the economy. Check review is another metaphor, another term that's become quite common in public policy discourse during this crisis. When I was demitting office as governor way back in 2013, September, the media asked me what advice do I give to Raghuram Rajan. I said the only advice I would give him is that I performed like Abhimanyu. I knew how to get into the check review, I did not know how to get out. I advised Rajan that he should perform like Abhijan. He should know how to get in and also know how to get out. And Raghuram Rajan truly performed like Abhijan. My close friend, former colleague, late Subir Gokhan used to say that crisis management is a percentage game. In the middle of the crisis, you do whatever you think is going to work. Some of those things work well. Some of those things do not work so well. You do not have the time to think through all the ramifications of every policy. But in exiting from the crisis, you have to be very thoughtful, very deliberative, careful, cautious. As indeed we are seeing today, the lockdown was imposed rather abruptly. But as the lockdown has to be eased, we are seeing a lot of thought going into red zones, orange zones, green zones, etc. When we went into the lockdown three weeks ago, excuse me, on 24th of March, we thought that at least most of us thought that we'll go through this three week lockdown. By the end of this three weeks, we will emerge as a country with zero incidence of Corona crisis. We know now that that was excessive optimism. Now we reconcile to living this, with this virus. This virus will be with us for several months, perhaps several years until a vaccine is discovered. Meanwhile, we have to learn to live in a low level equilibrium. That poses two immediate challenges. How to gradually ease the lockdown, how to gradually restart the economy. Lifting the lockdown, I do not have much to say beyond what's already known publicly, but on restarting the economy, a few comments. First, we've got to be careful that we we stimulate demand and supply in tandem, consistent with each other. If we have too much demand and not enough supply, we'll have inflation. If we have too much supply and not enough demand, we'll have glut. Both of them are bad. So we've got to be cautious and we've got to be sensitive to that. Second, importantly, we've got to attract our informal sector labor force back to the cities. As a nation, we've realized how much value these informal sector workers, millions of them, add to our economic output, our economic activity. We, know, we now realize how important they are. They've borne they've the brunt of this pandemic. They're going back or they have gone back to their villages. We have to attract them back and they're not going to come back unless their quality of life is going to improve when they come back. We've got to pay attention to that. The third thing we've got to pay attention to is this. The lockdown is going to be lifted on a geographic basis. But protection 
has to be restarted on a supply chain basis. Even if a factory is in a green zone, it's got to cut across orange and red zones for the entire supply chain to work. So we've got to think through that. And most importantly, we've got to think through how to ensure that banks lend to the private sector, as I've said before. Three or four things are important. Restructuring of loans. Banks must restructure loans which have gone bad only on account of the pandemic. So the test is, if a loan was viable, before we enter the lockdown, that loan deserves to be considered for restructuring. Banks should give additional credit. And for giving additional credit, as I said, government must come out with a credit guarantee or credit enhancement scheme. Also, some of our large corporates, some of our medium level companies, even small firms might want to raise capital. Government should come out with a scheme, something like the top in the US during the global financial crisis, to help private firms raise capital. And I want to emphasize once again, that support to medium and small industries is especially important. That takes me to the final issue, the eighth issue, is the India growth story intact. I believe it is. Our India growth story is intact because we have a growth driver that most other countries do not have. That growth driver is consumption. We're a country of 1.35 billion people per capita income of just over $2,000. If you put some money in the hands of those households, they're going to spend that. That spending is per production. That production is per investment. That's per jobs. That's per growth. So we'll get into a virtuous cycle. But that cycle will not start automatically. The big challenges, the big challenges are to accelerate the growth rate and second, to ensure that the benefits of growth go to low-income countries. We need rapid growth with widely shared prosperity. If you ask me to say in one word, what is it that we need in order to accelerate growth and in order to share the benefits of growth? The one word answer is investment. If you jack up investment, that will generate jobs, that will generate growth. But investment is going to, not going to come back on unless we implement reforms, structural reforms. I don't want to get into that. We know what they are, land, labor, urban sector, agricultural marketing, investment, etc. More important, but less acknowledged than structural reforms is governance reforms. It's not enough to have good policies in Delhi or in our state capitals. What is required is implementation of those policies at the front end. Many of our investors, many of our entrepreneurs still complain of many problems at the front end. We've improved considerably on the ease of doing business ranking in the six years of the Modi government. When the Modi government came into office, we were somewhere in 120 or 130 in the World Bank's ease of doing business. Now we rank 63. That's very commendable. But we must also recognize that the ease of doing business is not a very accurate indicator of the ease of doing business. Vietnam. Vietnam, for example, ranks lower than us in terms of uh, ease of doing business, but they attract much more investment. Therefore, we need governance reforms to improve uh, the entrepreneur investor experience. So finally, in conclusion, I believe that the India growth story is intact. Realizing the promise of the India growth story is possible, is probable, but not inevitable. It will not happen unless we have the right policies and we implement those policies uh, with the right impact. Thank you very much. And this is the final summary of the eight issues that I have covered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Subara. This was a complete authority 
on every subject on every aspect of the problem and your solutions uh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, experience listening to you we learned a lot thank you so very much indeed uh, as you could see that there are huge number of questions that have come up there are about 820 people uh, right now listening to you uh, what uh, vikram and i would do is uh, pick up some questions which we think uh, are important and then ask you and then we'll see how many more we can carry on with uh, i'll start then vikram will will alternate between him and me uh, you have said that india can expect a v-shaped recovery some people believe that it could be a u-shaped recovery or even a w-shaped recovery what makes you <laughs> confident that it will actually happen a v-shaped recovery this is the uh, question. thank you thank you Ajay. that's a very yeah that's a very important question and i hope an answer to that because uh, i uh, i went over that quickly without elaborating you're right it's no standard practice in literature to think of recovery from a recession in terms of the various alphabets. A V-shaped recovery, which is quite intuitive, the sharp downturn, but an equally sharp upturn. A U-shaped recovery, which is a sharp downturn, but takes a long time to get back to the original level. And an L-shaped recovery, where a sharp downturn, but you take a very, very, very long time to get back to the original level. Most recessions, we've seen a V-shaped recovery, except the global financial crisis of 2008 when many countries, many rich countries saw a U-shaped recovery. Some like Greece are even now going through an L-shaped recovery. Why do I say a V-shaped recovery is possible? I say that for this reason, as I said earlier too, which is that this is not a natural disaster. This is not a cyclone or a flood or an earthquake. Our infrastructure is intact. Our transport system is intact. Our factories are intact. So with the right policies, we can engineer a V-shaped recovery. But what that requires is all the things that I've covered, including right stimulus policies. That is conditional, of course, on the pandemic being beaten soon enough and with the right policies being instituted. I must also talk about a W-shaped recovery you, talk, you, you raised. It's possible also that we'll have a W-shaped recovery if the pandemic comes back in waves. And that's why I said that it's important to keep some of the policy ammunition stored for use later on. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you, sir. But uh, we must continue this conversation. There's an avalanche of questions. But uh, there's a question here uh, which comes from your speech that they, they, some, one of the questions I think that you're being too cautious on the fiscal deficit. Many mm -hmm. countries, USA, UK, European nations, they are spending much higher percentage of their GDP. They don't seem to be worried about ratios like fiscal deficit to GDP, debt to GDP. What is the justification for your caution? <laughs> the justification for my caution is that we're not a rich country. Rich countries have the fiscal firepower. As they say, they can throw the kitchen sink at the problem because they can borrow. They have the borrowing power. We don't have that. Second, rich countries issue debt in currencies that everybody wants. America. America has a huge fiscal deficit going as much as 15% of GDP. But America can still borrow because America's currency is the dollar which is the world's reserve currency. Everybody wants to lend to America, including all of us who have some dollars in our pockets. Whereas the rupee is not useful outside of India. Therefore, that's the second difference, that we don't issue debt in currencies that other people want. The third difference is that markets are more forgiving of rich countries, the less forgiving of poor countries. Since you raised this issue of my being too cautious, to remove any misimpression, I must say that I'm not against additional spending. I'm not against additional borrowing. What I'm against is open-ended borrowing. 
What I'm suggesting is that there must be a limit set up front so that you're transparent, accountable, efficient, and most importantly, you retain market confidence. Sir, there are some people who are saying that the RBI should directly finance government borrowing. This will <coughs> avoid the problem of interest rates becoming too high for the private sector. The Bank of England is already doing that in the UK. Can the RBI similarly finance government directly in India? <laughs> I have answered that question in several, several forums over the last three weeks. Uh -huh. The answer is yes and no. Actually, mm -hmm. no and yes. Let me give a bit of a historical context to that. Up until 1994, the RBI was directly financing the government. The government used to make a budget and say, this is our revenue, this is our expenditure, this is our deficit, the RBI will finance this. And the RBI dutifully used to print currency and give it to the government. In 1994, we stopped the practice. There was an agreement between the RBI and the government, a landmark agreement when Dr. Rangarajan was the governor, Dr. Manmohan Singh was the finance minister. That agreement ended this practice. And with that practice, a lot of bad things ended. Financial depression ended. A lot of distortions in the economy ended. A lot of good things started happening. What are the good things? Because financial depression ended, because the government was borrowing at market determined interest rates, interest rates in the economy went up. That incentivized, encouraged savings. Savings increased which turned into investment, which turned into growth. So that, that was the first positive outcome of the agreement. The second positive outcome was that it gave control over the amount of money supply to the RBI. Earlier, the amount of money supply was determined by the fiscal deficit, which was determined by the budget. But after this agreement, the amount of money supply, control over that came to the Reserve Bank and the RBI could therefore control inflation. And third, because the government was borrowing at market determined interest rates, the government presumably became sensitive to the interest rate cost of that borrowing, and that would put some restraint on the fiscal deficit. So all these good things happened because of the landmark agreement in 1994. So now, if you want to reverse that, even for a temporary period, we've got to be very cautious because all the bad, good things will reverse. Savings will go down, control, control over inflation for the RPI will be lost. Um, government's interest rate sensitivity might decline. And you raise the issue of other countries doing this. Other countries are doing because that is their situation. I don't believe we should be doing everything that other countries are doing. Therefore, I believe that the RBI should do this or can do this after exhausting all other means. The RBI can still support government borrowing by open market operations, by govern buying government bonds and treasuries in the market, inject further liquidity. But if they find and if they determine that the interest rate is getting too high, and it's crowding out, entirely crowding out private investment, I think there'll be a time, some time, for the RBI to consider, and in fact, actually finance uh, government debt directly. But that should be done after much caution as a nuclear option once, as a one-time measure for a very limited amount. Uh, before Vikram asks you the questions, you may want to just uh... Uh, stop sharing the screen so that uh, your image comes up on the entire uh, window. Okay, okay. Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> That's good, sir. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. I missed that in all the nervousness of answering the questions. <laughs> no, 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 no. The question I have is that from what I hear from you, uh, the approaches of RBI till now has been very, very conventional. I mean, it's going as per a standard theory. And there are a lot of questions here which say that RBI is not being bold enough. Uh, there are many unconventional things, <laughs> quantitative easing, directly, <laughs> sector, 
why can't RBI do some of these things? I mean, the, the, I, I can see at least 50% of the questions are from people who want quantitative easing and even just printing money. Why can't they do that? Yeah, that's a good question and a difficult question to answer, Vikram. First, I must say this, that the view that RBI is not doing anything unconventional <coughs> is mistaken. RBI is doing a lot of, <coughs> RBI is doing a lot of things that are unconventional. For example, it's injected liquidity. Injecting liquidity is conventional, but the amount of liquidity that RBI has injected over the last couple of months is very, very unconventional. So that's the first thing unconventional they've done. They're doing this targeted LTROs, targeted at the corporate bond market, small and medium enterprises, the NBFCs, the housing finance companies. There's a repo window of mutual funds. These are all unconventional. I believe the RBI has room for conventional policy still before they go into further unconventional things. They can cut rates further because there is room for cutting rates. They can inject further liquidity through the conventional means. And they can do macro prudential measures. So there is room for RBI to do a lot within the conventional realm of policy arsenal. And as I said before, we should not do anything just because other countries are doing. Just take the example of quantitative easing. America, Europe, England, UK, Japan, more than anyone else, they're all doing quantitative easing. They did that before, they're doing it now. What is quantitative easing? Quantitative easing is that when a central bank starts buying government debt, government bonds, treasuries, gills, uh, whatever they're called in various countries, in order to inject liquidity. There comes a point when those uh, instruments are exhausted. But confidence in the market is still low. The central bank finds that it needs to inject further liquidity. So what does it do? It expands the collateral that are, are the or the securities that you'll buy. You'll buy corporate bonds. You'll buy the bonds of local governments, municipalities. Therefore, that can be done. That's quantitative, quantitative easing. So in India, the time for quantitative easing is not done. If indeed that needs to be done, I think the RBI should start with the buying state development loans. You know, they're buying central government bonds now. They should start buying state development. I'll stop there. Uh, a related question to RBI, and uh, that it has huge <laughs> foreign exchange reserves. Why can't it give it to the government in this hour of need? Oh, how I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, even if you wish, Vikram, no, absolute no, no. Okay, it's highly inadvisable at any time, particularly in a crisis time like this. I think this is the time to jealously guard this balance sheet of the Reserve Bank, especially because the balance sheet of the government is weak. When your fiscal balance sheet is weak, it's all the more important that the monetary balance sheet is strong. The government, I believe, will gain a lot more by leveraging on a strong balance sheet of the Reserve Bank rather than eating into it. Any move to eat into the central bank balance sheet can be seen as a desperate move. And that's not a signal we want to send at a crisis time like this or indeed at any other time. RBI needs the foreign exchange reserves in order to instill confidence about our exchange rate. And I believe therefore that to suggest that RBI should liquidate the reserves and give that to the government, even though this is uh, an hour of need as the question says, is highly inadvisable. Sir, uh, again, the uh, connected to this is there are many questions here saying that uh, RBI or the government should permit rupee to, depo uh, to depreciate to 90 or 110. Uh, <laughs> it has already depreciated quite a few, quite a, it's now 77 or 78. Two questions, sir. Will it depreciate further? And is it in India's interest to allow it to depreciate? 
<laughs> the short answer is I don't know. Okay. Uh, see, when I was governor, actually, when I first took over as governor, my staff briefed me. In fact, whenever you go into a new job, your staff brief you. And when I went in as governor, staff briefed me. And they told me, don't ever make a statement or a comment on the exchange rate. You note that the RBI makes statements on growth rate, on inflation rate, on credit growth, on money supply. They never ever make a statement on the exchange rate. But since I'm now ex-governor, let me wade into the question. Okay. The rupee has depreciated somewhat. And most of the depreciation took place in the month of March when a large amount of capital, about I believe about $80 billion, left our country and the rupee depreciated. And as I said earlier, the rupee depreciation has been less than the depreciation of the currencies of peer countries like Mexico, Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa. And I believe we should not read too much into the movement of exchange rates. Today, the rupee is 76 to a dollar. It is not as if tomorrow, if it becomes 74 to a dollar, that our economy has strengthened, and if it becomes 78 to a dollar, that our economy has weakened. Uh, we must treat exchange rate movements as an ordinary course of business news. Why do exchange rates move? Exchange rates move because of current account balances. If our exports are more than our imports, we have a current account surplus, our exchange rate will appreciate. If our imports are more than our exports, we have a current account deficit, the exchange rate will depreciate. That used to be the case 10, 15 years ago. But these days, exchange rates respond more, not so much to current account movements, but more to capital movements. Lots of money comes into countries, goes out of countries. Billions of dollars come into India, billions of dollars go out of India and exchange rates are influenced by capital movements rather than current account. As I said, in the month of March, and I, to some extent even in April, a lot of capital left India. Investors who put money in India took it back. Why did they take it back? They took it back because they became nervous. That nervousness was not on account of anything that was happening in India. That nervousness was about what's happening around the world. When investors are nervous, they pull out their investment, go back to their home country. So all the investment that was in India in hard currencies went back to the home countries. The dollar appreciated. Because the dollar appreciated, the rupee depreciated, not because of any abrupt change in our fundamentals, but because capital left. So I believe that we have sufficient reserves today. We have buffers, foreign exchange reserves, oil prices crashed. I believe the external sector is relatively safe. Uh, and I believe that uh, to the extent that the rupee depreciates, we should allow it to depreciate, but the RBI should not be intervening too much to deliberately depreciate the exchange rate. The standard policy of RBI is that they will not intervene in the market unless there is undue volatility. Although undue volatility is not explicitly defined, but the market to some extent has got to understand that. We should not allow the rupee to depreciate just because we want to help our exports. I think we should let market forces rule and that's good for our economy in the long term. Yeah, interesting. Uh, sir, there are reports and there are at least three, four questions on this that uh, because of the crisis that originated in China, uh, China is becoming an unreliable place to remain. Would the global supply chains actually move out? And if they move out, do you think there is an opportunity for India to uh, host them? I think so. There certainly is an opportunity. Okay. Uh, India can certainly take advantage of the space being vacated by China. This movement of supply chains out of China started long before the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know. The Trump trade war started two years ago. America started slapping on slapping tariffs on imports from China. Therefore, the supply chains readjusted to escape those tariffs and supply chains gradually have to some extent moved out of China. There was an expectation 
that India will be a natural alternative to China because of our huge economy, because of our large labor force. And we have some advantages that China does not have. We have English, democracy, a decent legal system. The expectation was that uh, some of those supply chains will come, come to us, even though admittedly our productivity levels, our skill levels are lower than that of China, but they are better than most of our rivals. But the disappointing thing is this, that over the last two years, even as supply chains moved out of China, not much has come India's way. Much of the flow has been towards Korea, towards Taiwan, towards Thailand, Vietnam, to some extent towards Malaysia and the Philippines. The worry is that we miss the first wave of supply chains, that we might miss the second wave of supply chain readjustment. Again, what this means is that uh, we must get back to improving the ease of doing business in a real sense. As I gave the example of Vietnam earlier, Vietnam ranks six, lower than us. We rank 63. They rank lower, lower than us. But Vietnam is attracting the supply chains more energetically than India is able to do. And we should concentrate on structural reforms and on governance reforms to attract the supply chains in order to capitalize on the current global situation. No, sir, uh, the, the question here to, does not seem to be agreeing with you. Uh, he says the businesses will not get out of China or India. Business will see the corona crisis ending globalization and people will start building their own competence. Mm. Countries will start building their own competences. And do you see this as an end of globalization? Uh, that's a very substantive question. And uh, it's not easy to give a definite view. But I know I wrote a paper on that recently, <laughs> so let me give somewhat of a structured response. The dominant view today is that uh, the corona crisis has been caused by unrestricted cross-border movement of people. That even before uh, uh, the the, the it is caused by movement of people out of China and uh, it engulfed the whole world. So the enormity of the tragedy, the enormity of the crisis will force a recalibration of globalization. There's an extreme view which says that uh, countries will go, go back into their shelves, they'll become islands, they'll uh, construct moats around themselves, Globalization, as we know, unrestricted movement of uh, goods, services, capital, people, ideas will come to a stop. Uh, that will be the end of globalization. That's one extreme version. There's another view which says that uh, once this bitterness, this anguish is behind us, we'll take a more recent uh, view of globalization. We will not retreat into complete disintegration of globalization. There will be some adjustment taking place. Supply chains might become shorter. There might be protocols, health check protocols at borders as there are checks today for security. There will be some compromising on efficiency for ensuring that there is inventory available. So I believe on considered thought that the more pragmatic version whereby some recalibration will happen, but globalization will not altogether end, I think will be the, uh, will be the more probable outcome of this. A corollary to this is what would its impact be if there were a retreat of globalization? You mean on uh, on, on India's Indian... prospects? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I must say that uh, one of the less acknowledged realities of the India growth story is that uh, our growth story 
exports a lot to our exports over the last 10, 15 years. We have traveled on the coattails of globalization. The India growth story that we saw before the global financial crisis and to some extent over the last 10 years has been a consequence of increasing exports. So if exports go down to some extent, that growth driver will erode. But as I said, we have another growth driver, consumption. And our challenge will be to engineer that growth driver, to rebalance our production to from production for exports to production for the domestic market. That is not to say that we must neglect exports. That is not to say that we should not go full force on maximizing our exports, but we must also be paying attention on maximizing on exploiting the consumption driver that we have, which means again, that we must accelerate our growth rate and make sure that the benefits of growth flow to low income households. So there's one very interesting question here, sir. It says that uh, why do we, why do the economists uh, believe that India's survival is depending only on growth? Uh, what he's saying is that if we don't grow, if we grow 0%, we still have a two trillion dollar economy, and we were only where we were last year. And last year we didn't worry about survival. I mean, I I, I, I want you to elaborate. No, the, yeah, I, I think that question is going into the realm of philosophy. Many economists, many philosophers ask that question. In fact, you know, if I, even though I'm digressing, let me give an example. In Japan, the whole world is worried that Japan is not growing except the Japanese. Now, if you go to Japan, you see their shops are full, their roads are full, uh, their restaurants are full. The Japan, Japan, in spite of not growing, the per capita income is growing because the population is declining. So no economy in human history has grown when the population has been declining. I'm talking with reference to Japan. Okay. So economic growth is not everything I understand. But for a poor country like India, economic growth is very important because we have enormous amount of poverty. There are more poor people in India than the entire continent of Africa put together. So in order to alleviate that poverty, in order to improve their livelihoods, we need growth. Yes, we were uh, a two trillion, uh, I think three trillion dollar economy last year, but we need to grow further. Unless we grow, we cannot support the livelihoods of the bottom half of our population. I believe growth is very important and equally important is to make sure that the benefits of growth are widely shared. Sir, one question that would flow from this past discussion is that every crisis leads to some major fundamental changes in society, in economics and in reforms. What do you see happening as a result of this crisis? And what should happen? What should happen? Okay. I have, you know, it's uh, lots of people are writing about it. Lots of people are thinking about it. So I have uh, read some, some articles, some papers, some views on this. Some things will change. For example, globalization will find a new normal. It won't be the no holds barred globalization that we saw over the last 30, 40 years, or indeed over the last 100 years. It will be a new normal whereby there will be more restricted globalization, but globalization all the same. I think because of the crisis, and indeed more because of the crisis, the US China rivalry might intensify. We might see a new Cold War. How that will evolve is difficult to uh, reflect right now. It won't be the same Cold War like between the US and Soviet Union. It'll be a different Cold War because this Cold War will be based on, uh, on the power of economics rather than the power of ideology that, that drove the US-Soviet Union Cold War. That's the second thing. The third, I think, will become more technology driven. Uh, we're seeing uh, in the course of this lockdown itself, the use of technology uh, that's been a trend over the last uh, 
um, what, 30, 40 years, especially since the iPhone and iPad have been discovered or invented. So we will become more technology driven and uh, that has both positive and negative. Uh, as much as we derive the positives, we must make sure that the negatives out of the big tech, out of uh, technology driven lives do not become uh, too big. For example, just to give an example, <clears throat> a surveillance society. Okay, today we want to give access on our phones to uh, to the to the governments or authorities so that they can track the spread of the pandemic. But how will this be used after this crisis is behind us? Also, I think pandemics, which so far have been black swan events, will no longer be black swan events. What's a black swan event? A black swan event is a low probability, high impact event. I think pandemics will become high probability, high impact events. And finally, one last thought, which derives from some of the questions and one uh, issue that I raised, which is that in the scheme of things, the local governments might become more important to the quality of lives to the safety nets of people and to the livelihoods of people, especially in poor countries. So some, those are some of my reflections on how the world might change after the corona crisis. Great. Uh, there are still 150 to 250 questions. Would you mind spending another 10, 15 minutes? Sure, I'll be happy. Uh, have a glass of water and... Uh... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There are quite a few questions, sir, and in fact, the questions are very, very impressive. Very impressive. Uh, yeah. I, 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 wouldn't even I hope not you. difficult. <laughs> no, no, not difficult, but some are very interesting. For instance, one I can see here. Uh, what do you think of the strategy of government not decreasing fuel prices just to clean up their own balance sheet? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Oil prices went down import price went down. So there is benefit to the economy. The question before the government is, should we transfer that benefit to the consumer straight away? Or should the government appropriate that benefit by way of a tax revenue and then spend it? That's not a new question. That's not a new dilemma. It is a very, very common public policy issue. I believe what the government has done is the right thing. And that's for the following reason. <clears throat> if the government allowed the oil price crash to go to the consumer price and to reflect in the pump price, as they say, the benefit would have gone to consumers of petroleum products, especially to people who have cars, motorcycles, uh, other motorized transport. Uh, who use more of the uh, more of the uh, petroleum fuels than other people. Whereas, if the government appropriates the benefit, it can it can use that money in the most efficient way in order to spend it on the most needy item. Today, for example, the highest need, as we discussed, is livelihood support. It's also enlarging and expanding and improving medical infrastructure. It's also providing guarantee. So if the government preempted the benefit of the oil price crash, they can better distribute the benefit of that uh, price decline. And I believe what the government has done is the right thing to do. What, I mean, one of the, uh... Uh, as you mentioned in um, uh, your talk, the big hit is going to be taken by businesses, especially with the small and medium businesses. What specifically should the government do to, to support uh, the small and medium businesses so that many of them who are likely to close down will come back and start contributing to the economy? Yeah. No, that, uh, you know, I don't have the benefit of consulting with uh staff or experts, so I have to, you know, extemporate my response. But yes, what the private enterprises, particularly MSMEs, need is support now during the lockdown. 
because they're being asked to maintain payments, statutory dues, salaries, etc. And more importantly, they need credit support when they restart production as the economy is restarted. Banks are required to lend to them. RBI has cut rates. RBI has injected liquidity, but there is only so much the RBI can do. And banks are not forthcoming in lending as we've seen. Therefore, the government has to come into the picture by way of a credit guarantee or credit enhancement scheme. There are very many ways in which this can be designed. This can be designed in ways that it has a disproportionately higher benefit flowing to smaller industries. It can be designed in such a way that it maximizes the economic impact. So it can be designed in ways that puts together or meets several objectives together. So I, I think providing a credit guarantee support to banks as much as we're asking them to continue to lend is very, very important. So there's a 180 degree opposite. Uh, there's a question here which says that, you know, we have seen the benefits of Kerala in, in uh, or what, how, on their response to the crisis on education, on their policies of education and health. Uh, do you see the government of India learning from Kerala and changing their long-term policies on education and health and see that, you know, had they done it before, maybe the, our <coughs> response would have been better? You know, in every crisis, there are counterfactuals. Uh, what would have happened if they did this? Why didn't they do this in, this in time? Okay, what Kerala has done is commendable. And every state, the central government, indeed many other countries, should learn from what Kerala has done. What Kerala has achieved is remarkable. That is in part due to the agility of the government, in part due to the awareness of Kerala people, their educational health standards. But Kerala, we must recognize in this context, also has a lot of expat population. So Kerala ran the risk of the expat population returning to the state much more than other states. Therefore, Kerala was aware of the risk profile of the pandemic much more than other states. So I think the other states in the country and the central government have a lot to learn from Kerala. Kerala what Kerala has done is commendable, not only in this crisis, but over the, over the long term, in terms of their health and education, but also in terms of uh, devolution to the local governments. Kerala has set an example. So other states must learn. And one of the advantages of a cooperative fisc of federalism is that uh, we learn from each other and what is good somewhere is mainstream everywhere else. The Nobel laureates, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, what is their central message? The central message is that not everything works the same way everywhere. Therefore, we must learn from what works somewhere and try to adapt that elsewhere. So other states must learn from Kerala and Kerala too must continue to learn from other states. As far as the lockdown is concerned, yes, as I said, uh, there could always be counterfactual questions. Uh, Kerala has done it sooner than other states, but I believe that uh, it's good that India has come down with the lockdown much sooner than most other countries. Uh, one question is, what is the ideal level of debt to GDP ratio and where do you see mm -hmm. India heading in the next few months? Yeah, that is somewhat of a technical question, you know, what's yeah. the ideal level of a debt GDP ratio? Our debt GDP ratio is about 70% of India's. Okay. And uh, it will perhaps go up if the GDP does not grow as fast as debt. Debt GDP ratio will grow as a consequence of this crisis, but it is not as if it will remain high. It can be brought down if growth accelerates ahead of the debt level. There are some studies, especially from the IMF, from uh, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, which have put some limit about what is an acceptable debt GDP level. Uh, I don't remember the numbers, now there are absolute limits. 
But I don't believe absolute limits for all countries uniformly across all countries, across all economic strata countries is correct. Different countries have different acceptable levels. Japan, for example, has a very high debt to percentage, debt to GDP percentage, but Japan is still a viable economy because Japan borrows mostly uh, in their domestic market. India too borrows mostly in its domestic market, but the foreign component of our debt is gone down. In determining what is an acceptable debt GDP ratio, we also have to recognize that uh, low revenue countries, if our, if our revenue to GDP is low, our debt to GDP also has to be low. In other words, we can get into a debt crisis at a lower debt to GDP ratio if our revenue to GDP ratio is also low. Our revenue to GDP ratio today is about, I think about 17 or 80 percent combined center and state governments. So if that ratio goes up, you can afford a higher debt to GDP ratio, but we must be wary of the debt, the debt to GDP ratio is an important variable. It's not the only variable, but it's an important variable. There is a philosophical question that is being asked. And the question is something like this. Is it true that all great economies need to go through a seriously exploitative phase and that a large section of citizens are exploited for a minority? Something similar to the fact that you build economies on a large carbon footprint before you turn clean. You know, I'm not a student of history, not a student of philosophy, but yes, uh, the central thesis of uh, communism is that uh, there is exploitation of labor by the capitalists, and that exploitation will go to such an extent that the labor will rebel, and there will be a rebellion or an economic transformation. The economy will be taken over by labor from the capitalists. And exploitation is a necessary, if also a sufficient condition for an economy to grow. But we've seen that many countries today have grown, have achieved prosperity without going through that phase of communism. So I don't believe exploitation or an exploitative economy is a necessary or a sufficient condition. You know, some of you might have read that book by, by uh, uh, Why Nations Fail, uh, by Robinson and uh, I forget the other name, okay? Uh, what they talk about is this, that entire human development, historical economic development can be uh, interpreted or explained by the development of institutions. If there are positive institutions, the economy will grow. If there are exploitative or extractive institutions, the economy will not grow. That is one thesis, very convincing thesis. I don't believe that is a complete explanation, but that is some explanation uh, in response to this question. But to sum up again, to my rambling response, I believe that uh, exploitative economy is not a necessary or a sufficient precondition for economic development. Sir, I, 